good. It's so awesome, so wonderful that you have come, and I think it's important for you to stick the course. Uh, depends on what the Holy Spirit does, but over the course of the next four, maybe six weeks, we're going to be really, really diving in to this series. Now, I know that it's Super Bowl Sunday. How many of you want the Pats to win? Show your hands. Yeah, me and you. The rest of you, you need to repent of your sins. That's all right, chaps. We got this. <laughs> we pray, okay? Uh, and deflate balls, but who cares? Uh, so because I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, I'm going to keep you an extra 45 minutes, all right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to try to actually uh, be quick, but I will tell you, I will tell you, this is one of the most important topics that we truly uh, can discuss, and therefore there is a lot of work that goes into this. A lot of prayer, a lot of study, a lot of preparation. I don't want to just spit information at you. I really want you to leave transformed, whether you're single or you're married, because the truth is, statistically, each one of you will be married or are married, and that's just the way it goes. So this will affect every single person in one way, shape, or form. So, off the top, I really want you to pay attention. I have to get through some things before I can get to the goods. Look at your neighbor and say, the goods. The goods. So I want to start off like this. I want to start off by, by telling you that God created naked love. God created naked love. Matter of fact, His divine design in marriage is that it would be sexy, that it would be sensual, that it would be satisfying. But somehow along the way, the church and culture working together has redefined what marriage is and we've created this thing where marriage is looked at as less than, that it is sort of buttoned up, that it is bland and that it's boring. And so my time with you over the course of the next four to six weeks, depending on how much information we have or how bored you get, really will be unpacking this in a way that you can grab a hold of it and apply it to your life. But I've got to do some work first. Now, God created naked love. Where do we get that from? I want you to stand with me because we're going to read one verse. And this is really just to get you a little bit of exercise, even though I know you're already standing right now and you just finished worship. But this is God's word to us, just as Josh Eisen proclaimed. This is God's revelation to you. It is his gift to you. And so in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, out of the Amplified Version, here is what it says. This is God's word. And the man and his wife, by the way, my favorite verse in all the Bible, were both naked and were not ashamed or embarrassed. Can somebody say Amen. They were both naked and not ashamed or embarrassed. Jesus, help us today. Speak through me. Shut my mouth. Open yours for your glory and our edification. For it's in your beautiful name I pray. And the church said, Amen. You can sit down. You can go ahead and sit down. There's a short verse. A lot to cover, though, in all of this. Now, I want you to understand from the very beginning that men and women are created differently. You know this, right? I have a family picture that we're going to put up, and in this family picture, you are going to see that my son and I are sorely outnumbered, two to one. In my house, there's a lot of estrogen floating around the, the cosmos uh, and, uh, and through the vents and in the kitchen and in the bathroom. And so you can see that we are largely undermanned, quite literally, and so if you have daughters and you have sons, I have one son, three daughters, you're going to understand that there are vast differences between them. And, and so, for example, when my daughters were little, the two oldest ones before my son, who's the third child, came along, they would actually stay confined in what's known as a baby gate. You put a baby gate up, they're like, hmm, that's pretty, we're going to walk this way, we're going to do something. And, and not to mention that my two daughters, they honestly did not walk until they were about 15 years old. I don't even have a kid that's 15 years old yet. Uh, they didn't walk into their, I'm exaggerating a little bit, probably five or six, but they were talking at six months old. Crazy, I don't understand. That thing's not supposed to be speaking, but it is speaking. However, then my son came along. Now my son came out of the womb liking Spider-Man, and I'm not even making this up, <laughs> trying to climb walls. He sees a baby gate, he's like, I can, I can do that. I can hurdle that. We used to keep a baby gate between the living room and the kitchen. You remember this? And one day he climbed over the baby gate. I don't even know how many months old he was. He's probably a year old, maybe 15 months or 22 months, however you do that. And he found his way into the kitchen, into the cupboard, shut the cupboard door, and we couldn't find him anywhere. He's in there eating oatmeal raw. 
We open the cover, he's like, I mean, you could hog tie this dude, put a straight jacket on him, and he'd be like, I can get out of that. I can do that. And that was the first time we realized that there really is a difference between little boys and little girls. Matter of fact, my grandma, my great grandma used to have this, you know how your, your, your grandmas have cool things hanging up that you don't, that just don't make any sense to you now? She had this thing hanging up on the wall, and it said, little boys are made of, and maybe you've heard this poem, right? Little boys are made of, of snips, and tail, uh, snip, snips and snails and puppy dog tails, right? There you go. All the older people just dated themselves. And little girls are made of, of sugar and spice and everything nice, right? I'm just going to put my cards on the table and tell you right now that whoever wrote that was a woman, I don't know who wrote it, but if you look at that poem, I'm telling you, she was a woman and she was in a relationship that wasn't good, okay? Because if you really figure out what she's trying to convey here, what she's saying is little boys, what are they made of? They're made of snips. Do you know what those are? Those are snakes. Little boys are made of snakes and snails. You know what snails are? Leeches. So they're slithering leeches that smell like the rear end of a dog. Puppy dog tails. But little girls... They're made of, oh, sugar and spice and everything nice. So clearly there's differences between boys and there's differences between girls. We know that. But today, there has never been more confusion around this idea than we have ever known or experienced in our day. For example, now we ask questions like, how do you identify yourself? Maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this, but Facebook now, as of 2017, has, and I even tried this out, so if you've seen a status update on my Facebook wall that was a little weird and off, you can call me out on it. But they now have 71 different variations of gender that you can identify yourself as. 71. Go check it out. It's crazy. 71. Now, before we get too far into this, what I have to tell you, what I have to confess to you is that that if the church isn't a place where you can feel comfortable to bring your questions, where you can feel comfortable to bring your confusion regarding your sexual orientation or sexuality, then it's no church at all. Amen. Just because you don't struggle with this doesn't mean the person next to you doesn't. Or doesn't mean that the person next to you doesn't have a son or daughter that struggles with it. Or know someone who struggles with it. So I can guarantee you that there's somebody that you and I know, if not in this room, that truly does struggle with this concept of, of sexual orientation. And so you might be asking, why in the world, Pastor Jeremy, would you open up a series on naked love, which is a married series, talking about gender? I think that's a great question. It's a valuable question. The answer to that question is that if you and I are going to build our dream home, wherever it is, however wonderful it looks, how many car garage, beautiful in-ground pool, jacuzzi, so on and so forth. If we're going to do that, it would be foolish for us to begin this, this house building project starting at the roof, wouldn't it? Or in the bedroom, right? So we all know, if I can just be honest, all good foreplay doesn't start in the bedroom. And if you don't know that, now you know. You'll learn that. Just stay tuned. I promise you that. We actually have to start at the beginning. We have to start at the foundation. We have to figure out what the foundation is so that we can build eventually this thing called the bedroom and we can put the roof over this house and it doesn't just collapse. So we have to start at the beginning. And that's what I hope to do in our time together. I really want to give you some foundation before we get to the drapes and the accessories and the beautiful fire and the glass of wine and the white sheets and the beautiful breeze and all things that happen in the bedroom. We have to start at the beginning, otherwise we have no point of reference. You with me? You dig? Remember, you're supposed to talk back to me. This is the way we do it. If you talk back to me, I preach better, right? If it sucks so far, it's simply because you're not saying anything. It's your fault, not mine, all right? So I want, to start, I want to start with Jesus. I want to start with Jesus because Jesus was actually, he was, he was addressed, he, somebody came to him and had a question regarding marriage. We're talking about marriage, right? And so Jesus addresses the question in Matthew chapter 19. And I want to look at one verse. The verse is verse 4. Specifically, we'll read 4 and 5, but 4 is really what I want to dial your heart and your mind, your attention, your focus into. And here's what Jesus said. He, meaning Jesus, replied, Have you never read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Right? Now, we can just stop there. Have you never read? 
so, you might be here today, you might be wondering, hey, what are my origins? Where did I come from? What is all this about? And I want to tell you what Jesus is telling this young man. you got to read the Scripture. Have you never read? If you have these questions, they're going to be answered in God's Word. God gave you His revelation as a gift. And so He says, have you never read? And then what He starts doing is He starts paraphrasing and quoting Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And he does this beautifully. He, he kind of weaves this together into this beautiful kind of amazingly intricate sentence. And he says that he, meaning God, who created them, meaning Adam and Eve, from the beginning made them male and female. That's crazy. Now for you on the surface, it may look like just a sentence. But Jesus is doing so much here. He, God, who created them, Adam and Eve, from the beginning, made them male and female. Now, here's what I want you to understand. You and I are finite beings. Finite means limited. We have bounds. We can only go so far. Matter of fact, we, you and I, are confined to this thing called time. You can't actually explain very many things without using time as a reference point. Just the other day, I was having breakfast with uh, some friends of mine. They invited me to eat breakfast, and we're sitting down. We're trying to figure out what we're going to eat. And the lady, the waitress, comes up to us and says to us, do you need more time? To which I was like, yes, please give me 15 years. I'd love to be 20 again. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? For most of us, awesome, right? So she's, she's speaking in reference to this, this, this finite thing that we are, as human beings, and she says, do you need more time? You and I talk like this all the time, right? right? So, what time does church start? When do we have to get up? You know, what time is lunch? What time is this, the kickoff at the Super Bowl? When is your birthday? How long have you had children? How long has he been in prison? When is he getting out? All references to time. When did he die? When is your birthday? You understand what I'm saying? How long is this service going to be? It's all in reference to T-I-M-E, which means that we are finite, limited beings. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about this, and I don't have time to go into it, but you can read it, write it down. If you have your worship guide, you should be following along. Make sure I'm on track here. And, uh, and, it, and it talks about in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1-8. through 8. Time, time, everywhere, time. Time, time, time. Time to live, time to die. Time, 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 time. You and I are bound and defined by time. Yet Jesus in this verse, Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, says that, says that there is something before time. And it's important for you to grasp, to lay this foundation. Here's what he says. He, God, who created them from the beginning. From the beginning. That God is that something that was before the beginning that created male and female. That God is outside of time. That God is not finite like a human being, but infinite. He is not bound, but He's boundless. He is not limited, but He's limitless. And so when you look at culture, you need to look at it through the lens of the Scripture when it says that He, God, created them from the beginning. That there was a point in time where God started it. But before it, He already existed. Which means that He is infinitely powerful. For example, the Bible says in five days, we'll get to this in a little bit, He created something out of nothing. Now, here is not a trick question for you, Sumi. I'm just yawning in my sermon, man. You're going to make me have convulsions. What is in my hand? You're right. That's not a trick question. How many of you like magic? You're doing an awesome trick here, yeah? I like magic too, right? Awesome trick. Now, now I'm going to ask you again. On the count of three. One, two, three. <clears throat> what is in my hand? You're right. Nothing. But what if I could take this and make whatever I wanted, and as much of it as I wanted. Would I be powerful? Absolutely. And that's exactly what God did. 
So he is before us. And he has this power to create out of nothing what is. Now I have to take this even further. Because he says, He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. And what that word made means is that he designed them. He fashioned them. He set the rules for living. He is the one that divinely designed this thing called male and female. Not 71 other different flavors, but He defined the terms male and female. And that's very important for us to grasp in our heart when we come to this topic of marriage. He defined it. And so, therefore, what I want you to get is that God has an operation He has a way of doing things. And listen to me, please hear my heart. When you do things according to God's divine design, what happens is you flourish. When you do things outside of God's divine design, you fail, you falter, and you're flawed. This is why the Bible tells us that that we are not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him. It means God has a design for male and female. God has a design for children. God has a design for money. And when you lean on Him, you direct, you know, he, the Bible says that, that He will direct all your paths straight. This is what He'll do for us. Jesus echoed this same sentiment in John 10.10 10 when He said, The thief, this is Jesus, comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. So here's my point. This intelligent, divine God is before all things. He is infinite in wisdom and stature. He alone stands alone. He alone is the creator of all things, which means He is the common denominator of everything that exists. Matter of fact, everything that exists is birthed out of Him. He is before, He is preeminent, and He does not change. He is not inconsistent. He has no changeability with him, within Him. He is no variant. He always is and He always was, which means He gets to set up the rules of the game. And we have to abide by the rules if we're going to flourish. Amen. Now, you can choose not to, but you'll fail. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And this is why this is good news. How many of you remember GPSs in the car? Like Now they have them too, but they're not called GPS. You have to put the... <laughs> right? Turn on there. It never worked, you know. Now we have our phones. Before GPS is how many of you remember going to the gas station and getting one of those maps that's folded up like this, right? You go, <laughs> you are here. And, and you know you're never, I mean, it would be a miracle to get that thing back the way it was supposed to go and fold it away. Just, you just buy another one. That's what you do, right? Before we used things like that, how we determined our direction was we used fixed points. So there's a mountain. It's huge. It's in the distance. I'm going to fix my eyes on it. I know I have to keep headed that way. If I miss the mountain, I'm going in the wrong direction. Or rock structure. And this is how we came up with this thing called Polaris. Literally, it is the North Star. What's interesting about Polaris is that it is the only bright star within our horizon that looks like in relation to the Earth does not change. Matter of fact, it's constant. So that's why they call it true north, Leah. True north is that way. So if I'm this way, I know I need to turn right. I need to go from west to north because that is my fixed point. This is true in so many different ways. If you're jumping out of an airplane like I am, jump run, you have to figure out where you're jumping. You can't land somebody in parallel lines. You have to say, okay, there it is down there. That's my point of reference Now it's time to jump out of the airplane. And when you're out of the airplane, you don't know if you're spinning like this or not unless you have a fixed point. That's one of the things that they teach you. Focus on your circle of awareness, what's going on. If you're moving constantly, you need to fix that so that you go in one straight location, right direction. How many of you remember JFK Jr.? Anybody in the house? He died because his plane, instruments in his plane did not work. They stopped working. And he was flying at night. And something called spatial disorientation took place where he was no longer able to determine which direction he was headed. 
So he went straight down thinking he was flying this way. Why? Because there's no point of reference. And so the pilot's reality isn't correct, but he thinks it's correct, therefore he's headed for disaster. You track on so far? The Bible tells us that very truth like this. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. I want you to put it up. And it's tragic. Here's what the Word of God says. There is a way which seems right to a man and appears straight before him, but its end is the way of death. So here's what happens. You and I live our lives in this thing called culture. Culture is something that changes every couple of generations. And so the waves of cultures and the changes in the atmospheric pressure of the people that govern our lives say this is right and this is wrong. And therefore, we live our lives based on the changing culture rather than the timeless Word of God. And we get to the end of it saying, well, everyone else was doing it, but, but the Word of God says it, it ends in death. And so when we talk about marriage, when we talk about naked love, when we talk about what, what defines and what is marriage, I can confidently stand before you laying that foundation knowing that Jesus is our true north. And no matter what culture is doing or their church says, Jesus is the one we look to for the right answers and how to govern our lives because Jesus is the only one who was before all things and in whom all things have been created and actually exist. Do you understand that? Can you say amen to that? Yeah. He is our true north. He is our horizon line. He is what we look to. And we can become what He says we can become. And we need to define marriage not based on the shifting sands of culture, but on the timeless, immutable, unchanging Word of God. you understand? Amen. Got it? Okay, so this is what we are doing. This is why we're here. This is what my hope is in all of this. Which means that there are going to be times and spaces in our talk together. I love y'all that you're going to disagree. Men, you're going to disagree. Women, you're going to disagree. And that's okay. Because you, as a created being, cannot redefine the terms of creation. Neither can I. We can only submit to it. And so our hope, my prayer is that you flourish, and our hope, my hope, is that you lean into the power and the presence and the beauty, and the awe, and the grace, and the mercy of God who created you and has a great design for your life that you change. Because here's the truth, there are places and there are spaces in your life that are jacked up. And it's causing friction in your marriage. And so we need to realign ourselves, repent, and focus on Jesus as our true north to get those things worked out. You tracking? Pretty easy, right? And that's really what I hope to do in and through this entire series. And so, your question really begins then, how are we going to make that happen? How are we going to get to that place? Well, I want to take you back to Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, and I want to read it again. And I want to go a little bit deeper. And by the way, I do need to say this. If you and I served a creator, truly, if the Bible's true, right? Let's just pretend it is. You and I served a creator God that agreed with everything that you and I said and thought. What kind of God would he be? Well, he wouldn't be God at all, right? You'd be God. And much like there is no parent that gives every single thing to a child that asks for it, God will not give you everything. In fact, if you give everything to your child, you will create a sociopathic me monster little demon. You know better than they do. God knows better than us, and we need to submit to his will and to his way. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Are you still okay? Yes. Don't worry. I'm going to go fast. You're not going to miss the Super Bowl. Kicks off, kickoff is at 6.30, okay? <laughs> Get off me, all right? So Jesus here is talking about, this, the, talking about marriage to this young man, and again he says, Have you never read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Male and female, male and female, male and female, male and female, male and female. 
snips and snails and puppy dog tails and sugar and spice and everything nice. And he, God alone, is the only one that can call a little boy what a little boy is and a little girl what a little girl is because he defines the terms. And so the truth is there are differences like I opened up with. Differences. A man gets married and he thinks that his wife will never change. She does. A woman gets married and she thinks she can change him. She can't. True. Matter of fact, Dr. James Dobson, who is a clinical psychologist and a counselor, says that during the embryonic stage of development while we're in the womb, when a male embryo becomes a male embryo, there is this thing called a testosterone wash. It washes over the brain, and when it does, it causes damage to the left brain and the right brain so that they no longer can work in unison with each other. Truly. So men, the next time, here's a tip for you. If you haven't had anything practical yet, take this, put it home in your pipe and smoke it later on. Whenever you're in trouble with your wife, all you have to do is say, I am so sorry, honey. I'm brain damaged. <laughs> How many of you women know? Yes, he is brain damaged. He's, he's seriously... But women are different. You see, men, they, have, they lack, because of testosterone and the Y chromosome, they lack the ability to use both left brain and right brain simultaneously. This is why we're lim- linear. This is why we're goal-oriented. We're direct. We are vision. We, want, we know where we need to go, and we don't want to stop along the way, and, and we need to accomplish one thing before we get to the next thing. And women, they're not like that. They have neuro synapses firing all over the place, right? They can, they can flip it down, smack it, and reverse it while talking on the phone and making pancakes for the kids. Like, they can do these things that we can't, and we're just like, I don't understand. Let me focus on this first. I'm brain damaged. Matter of fact, look at your mate and say, hey, yeah, I'm brain damaged, and you know it, right? Go ahead, tell him. It's okay. We're all right. We can say that here, right? But he created a male and female, and during that wash, we became brain damaged. That's that's a change. There are many other changes. There are changes like men, you, uh, let's see, let's, let's go with this one. Um, uh, m- men have a hard time evoking emotion. It, it doesn't mean that we're not emotional. It means that we don't know how to actually talk about our emotions. Whereas women, they love to talk about their emotions. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, one time a month, it, it, those emotions are even heightened. One time a month, they're heightened, right? And so there's a variation there. There's differences between male and female. Get this. Ladies, you speak about 22,000 to 25,000 words a day. I did the math, and I'm not very smart, but that means that on average, in a 24-hour period of time, even when you're sleeping, you're speaking about 17 words a minute on average. 17! Man, we speak three to 5,000 words a day, which means, I'm rounding up, we speak about five words per minute, which is why your husband grunts and doesn't really say much. <clears throat> Matter of fact, on Sundays, I'm using a lot of words. When I get home, I'm like the walking dead. I don't want to say any. I just want to stare at the wall. I'm brain damaged. I'm jacked up. So many differences. Matter of fact, biologists and psychologists would agree that there are, there are more than 30 differences between male and female. 30 differences. Not to mention there are uh, 16 different character differences between male and female. Not to mention that, that ladies want love and men want respect, and that's a difference. And not to mention the fact that you know, um, there are, you know, their upbringing is different. Not to mention the fact that there's five love languages. Not to mention the fact that, that you're emotional and, 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 and that works. Itself. And then if you add all, to all of that up and you top on that a nice layer of pride and selfishness, you have marriage. Voila! The question is, did God actually know what he was doing when he created male and female? What was he thinking? We are so different. It's so crazy. What was he thinking? So, the last remainder of the time that I have, while I catch your attention before you fall asleep, what I'd like to do is explain that to the best of my ability in Holy Spirit. I pray that you help me to do that. Can we do that together? Okay. So what was he thinking? I want to look at Genesis chapter 2, 
Five verses, verses 20 through 25. Jesus actually referenced this in Matthew 19. I want to look at this. I think it might be helpful for us to read it and then refer back to it. I want you to become very familiar with this text. As a matter of fact, I really want you to just take a bath in it. I want you to soak it up. I want you to get it in your bones, seep it in the Word of God into your soul. And here is creation, right? This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, Have you not read? Here's how it went down. And the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper that was suitable, a companion for him. Here's what happened. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place, closed up the flesh at that place. By the way, I have a rib here. It's a real rib. It's been washed. It's not a human rib, but it's a rib. Here, catch it. Pass that around. It's a good sermon illustration. Had ribs the other day. So, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. Verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made fashion formed into a woe man, and he brought her and presented her to the man. Then Adam said this. Adam said, and then, matter of fact, he sang to her, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, this is where we started. Kids, keep having fun! Verse 25, and the man said to his wife, I'm sorry, and the man, brain damage, and the man and his wife, defining the terms, were both naked and were not ashamed or embarrassed. You with me so far? So what does that mean? Four things, four scenes. I want to run past you very, very quickly. They're not very detailed scenes, but here, if you're looking for the meat, the practical stuff for you to hold on to, this is what I would say is it for today. Even though, really, this, this, this message is purely foundational. The good stuff comes way after this, but you needed to hear this first before we could get there, right? All right, this is called theological foreplay. You're welcome. All right, so here we go. The first thing I want you to understand is the fix. The fix. So if we go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, and reread it again, we're going to see that there was a problem in paradise. We're going to see that there was a problem in paradise. You have Adam here. You have Adam here who all of a sudden is trying to name all the livestock and the birds of the air and every animal. But for Adam, there was not found a helper that was suitable for him. So he's seeing pairs of everything. Oh my gosh, there's a male and a female hippopotamus, a male and female dove. I'll call that a, a, a tiger and a tigress. I'll call that a horse and a, you know, whatever it is. That you, you know, he's naming all these things, but all of a sudden, at the end of everything, he's going, I'm still alone. And there's a problem in paradise. And what I want you to understand is, is that in God's divine design, he created the woe man to be the fix. He created the woman to be the fix. You see, in all of creation, God never said at the end of him creating man, and I'm getting ahead of myself, that it was very good until the woman showed up on the scene. Then he said, it is very good. Some of you chuckle. It's true. So here's the practical application. I want you to understand this, man. I want you to begin to reorient your mind to what God says we should view or how God says we should view our marriage partner. I want you to begin to view your marriage partner not as the, the, the fault in the relationship, but as the fix. Not as the fault. Not everything is her fault. Your laziness is not her fault. The fact that you have no clean underwear is not her fault, right? Anything else you want to blame on her, the way the kids are acting, is not her fault. You must take responsibility for your marriage. And Adam understood, wait a minute, I'm in paradise, but I'm alone. And God saw that it wasn't very good, and so he fashioned and formed out of Adam's rib this woman, presented her to him, and he sang and all of a sudden, 
everything was good and golden brown. Not to mention the fact that he brought her to him naked. And we'll get there later. So men, very, 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 very directly, stop blaming everything on your spouse. Start realizing she is the fix. I want you to understand right now that, pay attention to me, look at me, look at me, I don't want to lose you now, okay? Because this is where it's important. I wouldn't be half the man I am if it weren't for my spouse. I wouldn't be half of the man I am if it weren't for my wife. God has brought her to help me, to change me, to fix me, right? She is the fix, and I am so thankful. You've heard it said, and I'll say it again, behind every good man is a good? Exactly true. So this is God's divine design. What was he thinking? He was thinking the woman is supposed to be the fix. Let me go to scene two. You completely complete me. Remember Jerry Maguire? You complete me. Remember Jerry Maguire? Okay, so here we go. I've always preached this, that that is incomplete, but I think upon further review, I have been wrong. And I want you to understand that God is doing something here. If we keep going and we go to verse 21, what you'll see is, is that the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon him. Verse 22, he created the woman and then he took that rib and he fashioned and he formed into a woman and he brought her and presented her to the man. We know that what's going on here. And this is important for us to see. She is a part of us, that she completes us. So it wasn't that God just coughed up marriage, husband and wife. What, what the Word of God is telling us in these verses is that a man is incomplete without a woman. Yeah, here he is in paradise alone, incomplete. God takes a rib, forms and fashions woman, brings her to the man, all of a sudden he's complete. Same is true for a woman, that a woman is incomplete without a man. You may not like that, but this is the way God designed it. So very simply, I want you to begin to see your spouse as that part that completes you, that complements you, right? And, and, and I don't want you to see her or him as a frustration. I want you to see her or him as a gift from God. This is what's going on. Matter of fact, the Bible says, I think it's in um, Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, what God has brought together, let no man separate. The two shall become one flesh. One flesh. There is something so mystical and magical and a marital relationship within God's divine design when you understand that you are not two, but you're one. And that together you can do things that you'd never try to attempt to accomplish on your own because you are a team. And when you get that and you realize that when you fight with your spouse, you're actually fighting with yourself, you're going to start to live in a place where you'll flourish in your marriage rather than fail. But you have to get it on the front end. You tracking still? Let me move quick. Let me move quick. The third scene is the peace. Matter of fact, what do I have up here? Because I can't remember. You got it? Number three? Number three? Scene three? Boom! Matching pieces. There you go. Matching pieces. The way God designed us the way He formed us and He fashioned us is that your men, your zags, and her zigs are supposed to fit together. Your differences are supposed to con- or, uh, complement each other, not cause conflict. And this is so important for you to understand in your marriage. The, the Bible talks about, in these verses, these five verses, the fact that there was no helper That word in the Hebrew literally means rescuer. There was no rescuer that was suitable for him. The word suitable in the Greek means a matching piece. He looked at all the animals and said, I'm still without, and God created this person and gave her to him, and all of a sudden there was a helper that was suitable for him. This is your mate, your matching piece, and you need to see it. See, here's the deal. The things that used to attract you to your spouse now irritate you. Right? Ladies, he was so confident whenever we first got together. It was so amazing. And now I just see him as cocky and arrogant and rude. 
Men, it was so cute how she was so indecisive and her cute little nose and she couldn't make a decision to save her life. And Now it's irritating because we're in a drive-thru for 27 minutes and it's just Taco Bell. Pick something from the menu! <laughs> the things that you used to love now become the irritant. Why is that? Because opposites attract, but they also attack. And what I want you to see is that that's not the way God's divine design is supposed to operate. Matter of fact, if I could have Pastor Jeff and his wife come up, and if you could come up here, actually up here, I think that would work better, and hurry because the Super Bowl starts at 6.30, and I'm almost done. <laughs> and if I could have Pastor Rick come down here to the front, you can come on down here to the front, I want to show you something. While they're coming up here, I want everybody to raise your hand. One hand, it doesn't matter which hand. Raise the hand. I want you to look at your hand. Now look at your hand, and looking at your hand, I want you to see the tips and the dips. Trace it with your other hand. Just do it with me, okay? It's a good exercise. Trace the tips and the dips. Got it? The tips represent your strengths. The dips represent your weaknesses. Okay? Now, if you have a spouse here, I want you to put your hand against their hand like this. Matter of fact, you guys can do that. Go ahead and step up front into the front here. As close to the front as you can get where Pastor Rick can reach you, okay? If you have a mate here, if you have a, hu a husband or wife, if you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, or even a friend, I want you to do this with one of your friends, okay? Because we're relational beings. I want you to match your tips with their dips. Just put your hands together. And when you do that, look at it. I want you to physically look at the tips and the dips. You see this here? This is an illustration. Jeff's strengths are different than Angie's strengths. You see that? Jeff's weaknesses are different than Angie's weaknesses. And that's true for all of us. But when our hands are like this, I'm talking about matching pieces. Let me dial you in. When our hands are like this, we're in what I call slap mode. That's how you... That's how you slap somebody, right? Might be going on in your home when you're like this. Your strengths and their strengths are different. And you can actually see the differences when you do this. It's actually physical. Now watch what happens when I have Pastor Rick try to pull them apart whenever they're in slap mode. Pull them apart. No matter what, now try. Really hold your hands together. Okay? But here's what I want you to understand. These matching pieces, I want you to believe with me that in God's divine design, He actually created your weaknesses to complement your spouse's strengths. That you are an incomplete being, like we just said in point number two, and that God will use your spouse to round off an edge in your life that is weak. That you need your spouse to become the complete person that God wants you to be. So rather than slapping hands with your mate, we're going to do it up here. I also want you, I want you to instead clasp your hands. Rather than slap, slapping, I want you to clasp. All of a sudden, you're going to realize that your strengths complement her weaknesses. Do you see that? And no longer can you actually see where you're strong and she's weak. It kind of meshes together as one flesh. Now here's what I want you to do, Pastor Rick. I want you guys to hold on tight. You're not slapping anymore. You're clasping now. And Pastor Rick, I want you to pull their hands apart. Pull them apart! There you go, all right? So give them a round of applause. Why did I show you that? I showed you that because you need to get out of this mentality that you guys are warring against each other. You are one unit. God created you and created your spouse to intricately and beautifully weave together in this thing called life. Yes, you have weaknesses, but they have strengths. Yes, they have weaknesses, but you have strengths. And together, when you're clasped, not slapping, there's nothing and no one that can pull you apart. You will be married to the end, and that is God's divine design for you. Somebody should praise God for that. You are matching pieces. And it's a good thing, because that's how God designed it. The last is this, <laughs> number four. Men, I want you to see your spouse as a gift. I want you to see your spouse as a gift. And you can go ahead and start playing. 
I want to read these scriptures verse again. Genesis chapter 20, verse 22. Watch this. Watch what happens. Dial in. I'm just give me a couple of more minutes here. Watch. Genesis 20, or 2, verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made. He formed, he fashioned into a woman. And here's, watch this. Here's, watch, 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 watch. This is so great. He brought her and presented her to the man. Single people, listen to me. So much of your time, you're trying to look for the man. So much of your time, you're trying to look for the woman instead of waiting on God to do the work. You see, He made her specifically for Him. Now, I'm not saying I buy into soulmates. If you say I do, that's the way it goes. But what I'm saying is He formed and fashioned her, and the Bible tells us the God of the universe that gets to define terms because He's outside of time and He's infinite, it says that He formed and fashioned her and He brought her and presented her to the man. What's your point, preacher? My point is, men, you need to begin to see your wife as a gift again. I truly believe that this is the place in space where most marriages would be fixed if us men would simply remember what gift she was while we were dating her. Instead of calling her a thing, we call her our wife. Seeing her as a gift from God divinely designed to cover your weaknesses. A gift. A gift. Now ladies, that doesn't make you give you a hall pass to get off the hook. If you want to be treated like a gift, you need to start to act like a gift. <laughs> How about this, ladies? Act like a gift instead of a grump. Ladies, act like a gift instead of a grouch. Ladies, this one's going to sting. Act like a gift instead of gross. Because that's what God made you to be. You are a helper. The Hebrew word for woman is isha. Hebrew word for man is ish. And out of ish came isha, and together they are more powerful than separate. And you are God's gift to your husband. And don't let that go to your head. Act like it. But men, focusing on you for a second, how many times have you heard your spouse say, I just feel like I'm on the back burner? I have. I just feel like everything and everyone else is more important than me. I've experienced that. Matter of fact, I have a friend of mine who is a marriage counselor. And he was meeting with a broken woman, a wife, broken. And she said to him one day, I just feel like I am so many behind golf. Seeking clarity, he didn't understand, kind of cocked his head sideways and said, what do you, what do you mean? Please explain. And she said, well, I just look at the way He holds these clubs. They're so delicate, so soft. I just look at the way he takes care of them. He cleans them. He shows them off to his friends. He even pays money to learn how to use them better. He puts them away so gingerly. He's so delicate but he treats me like garbage. If my husband would be half as passionate about me as he is about those clubs, half as delicate with me as he is with those clubs, I would melt. I would follow him anywhere. 
Men, seeing your wife as a gift means practically that starting today according to God's divine design, there is nothing and no one except for God himself that comes before your wife. That she is your most important relationship. Not your buddies, not your hobbies, not your toys, not the kids. No one. She is your gift. Treat her like that. Beginning today. And watch if she doesn't open up and blossom. You might wonder why she's such a pain in the rear end all the time. Because you treat her like garbage, not like a gift. That's painful, but it's true. Your marriages can be awesome, man. I'm not saying ours is perfect. We've been married 16 years, but I'm telling you what, I love this woman so much. Sometimes I look at her and I'm like, I can't believe it. I look at her often, and a lot of times when I'm looking at her, she doesn't even know I'm looking at her, and I just have to take a double take. Like, wow, she's with me. (laughs) She's a gift. So some of you might be thinking, I've completely wrecked my marriage. Or we're struggling so bad. Things are so horrible, I don't think that there's any hope for us. I want to give you hope. I want to give you courage today. I want to remind you of a simple truth that is so profound and so powerful. And that truth is this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, He hung naked on a cross. Here's the best depiction of that that we have. They're going to put it up on the screen. And the thing that kept Jesus on that cross was His extravagant love for you. Jesus is the definition of naked love. He is the embodiment of it. The Bible says that He was bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That even though He knew no sin, He became sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of Christ. That because of His naked love on the cross, You and I can experience Genesis 2.25 naked love in our homes. And it could be good and it could be great because Jesus Christ paved the way for us to have it. He is greater than your spouse. He is greater than her past. He is greater than your arguments. He's greater than your sin. He loves you and He rules and He reigns. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Him and He alone gets to define the terms of your marriage relationship. And He wants to. See, what you don't know in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about this, but marriage really is a picture. It's a picture of His loving relationship with us. It's just a picture. That, that, that He loves us so much that wants to be in such an intimate relationship with us. A divine design. That He gave us marriage as a picture of how His relationship with us is supposed to work. So I want to challenge you to throw yourself at His mercy. In the spaces and places where you've jacked it all up, throw yourself on His grace. He is ready He is willing and He is able to work miracles in your life. You can have the best year of your life with your spouse. That's what He wants. So if you could just for a moment close your eyes with me. We're going to pray and get out of here. I want you men to think about the places and the spaces where you're not treating your wife as a gift like you're treating the golf clubs or the dog better than your spouse. Stop it. Stop it. Repent. Realize what God has blessed you with. Ladies, you be, the, you be the gift. Not the grump. Treat your man as the helper you were intended and designed to be. Both of you where you need to repent, repent. It's not your spouse's problem, it's your problem. Seek Jesus and what He accomplished on the cross for you that you might have new life in Him, new marriage, new hope. 
pray and ask God to reinvigorate the love that you should have for your spouse, but you don't, I promise you he'll answer that prayer. God, help me to love her like I should. God, help me to love him like I should. Forgive us of our sins. May we have the joy of being naked and unashamed. May we have the joy of naked love. God, right now I pray for every marriage in this room. You would do a supernatural work unlike anything we've ever seen before. You would heal. You would give a desire to fix, a desire to confess, a desire to forgive unlike we've ever experienced before, that You would bring relational healing to this room. God, those of us who have blown it, we seek Your forgiveness. Those of us who have made a mess, we ask that You straighten us out. Those of us who are single, we want to wait on You. Help us. Give us the strength. Give us the courage to wait on You to bring that gift to us. And in the meantime, we will work on becoming the right one instead of waiting for the right one. For the young people in the room and the people who aren't yet married yet, Father, I pray that they would take something here and apply it to their heart and life, that they don't have to go through the worst pain imaginable, which is relational pain. They would be wise to apply these things when they get to that place in their lives. Bring it to their remembrance. I ask all of this and the mighty, matchless, unchanging, untamable, beautiful, authoritarian name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen! Give God praise in this house this morning. Give God praise in this house this morning. He is worthy to be praised.